So I might be dating myself here a little bit, but when I grew up, MTV actually still had music videos. And a staple of my youth was a show called Headbangers Ball, hosted by the one and only Ricky Rackman, who's also a friend of mine and here with me today on One Up, One Down. How you doing there, Ricky? What's up? Well, when you say that it's dating yourself, a little considering bit. you're a lot younger than me, how do you think that makes me feel? <laughs> well, you were a lot cooler than me back then. Mm -hmm. I was just sitting there, you know, in my pajamas with my babysitter, trying to pretend like I was cool through you guys, but you were actually uh, the cool folks on the TV doing all the fun stuff. It's so funny because I get, because, you know, and, and the same thing I think goes for working in sports and working in rock and roll is most of us don't really get old. I mean, we do get old, but, you know, especially working in NASCAR, there's 50-year-old NASCAR drivers that act like they're 20. You know, and the same thing goes for rock and roll. So I don't realize that I'm getting older and older until I see some old person that tells me they grew up watching me. You know, that's kind of like a, oh, so if you were a kid, that means I must be way older than you. So it's kind of funny. Yeah, I mean, I interviewed Vince Neil for One Up, One Down, and, and they're going to be 60, right? And they're getting ready to go out on tour. And you're like, when did this happen? You know, like, when did this happen? <laughs> I don't think the tour is ever going to happen. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed because I uh, I'd be front and center if it was. Um, listen, so one thing with me, you know, covering sports and being part of so many moments in time, you don't really, I think, appreciate when you're part of it and, and sort of um, take it all in. Did you did you know that you were a, a part of a moment in time back in the '80s and '90s? Absolutely not. What you said is 100% correct because. In rock and roll, like I started with this club called the Cat House. Love it. And so I would, so I'd ask my friends to play, and they were just starting out. But my friends were like, you know, Guns and Roses and stuff like that. So all the all my friends' bands are playing my club, and I'm watching them get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I and it was very surreal. Like it's still still to this day, it's surreal to be at a sporting event and hear Welcome to the Jungle play, because that was just like our friends back then. And then when I did Headbangers Ball, which I never really watched because I was out on Saturday nights, I'd, I'd record it obviously. And, and for people forever to say, oh dude, I grew up watching you. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And now I realize like, don't underplay that. That show was really important to people. And for me just to say, yeah, whatever, is kind of not a very nice thing for me to do. So now that I appreciate how important that show was, cause it was, you know, it was great, but I, didn't realize until, you know, a decade ago that I was part of the most important scene in rock and roll, in my opinion, you know, the LA scene and doing Headbangers Ball. And, you know, I've interviewed everybody that I could ever want to interview, you know, from Nirvana to ACDC to Aerosmith to everybody, you know, and, and I did take a lot of it for granted. And, and now still hearing how important that show was to so many people. What do you think when you go back and watch some of those interviews now? Because, you know, you're sort of a seasoned media person at this point. You've been doing, you know, your podcast, which you got to give you a shout out. I, 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 listen to podcast. I think it's awesome. I, I, I love it. I do want to get into that. But, uh, you know, what do you think when you go back and you watch like young Ricky, who was, you know, really raw and you're with these rockers who also weren't worried about image and weren't worried about what they said or, or who they offended. Like, what do you think when you look back on those times? It's hard for me to watch that <laughs> because the one thing is I never, until this day, um, I've never said that I was a journalist or I'm just kind of a guy. And when I first started, you got to understand, I run this crazy decadent rock club in Hollywood and now they're putting me on TV and I didn't have any training. I never aspired. I always wanted to be a DJ, but I never aspired to do any of that stuff. So everyone you know, wanted to be a DJ, a VJ, by the way. Everyone wanted to be that? everyone wanted to be a VJ back in, you know, when MTV had VJs. I think everyone wanted to be. Well, when I was a kid, there was no such thing as a VJ, you know? And and it, you know what? Just to back up, one of the things that I didn't realize is I had, I mean, think about this for a second. I had the greatest job in the whole world. I mean, think like, it took me a while to figure out, it's like, I had the greatest job in the world. It's like, okay, Ricky, you're gonna have to go to England to interview Aerosmith. Okay, we're gonna send you over to Germany. You're gonna hang out in this castle with dancing. Oh, you're, and, I'm, and, and it just, so much happened so fast that I didn't really appreciate it. But as far as looking back, you know, I, I asked the questions that they wanted to know, the producers, the inspiration of the album. And then as I saw later in the year, it wasn't really apathy. 
but it was having conversations like what we're doing right yeah. now. We're just having a good time. We're just talking. So yeah. when I see a video of me with Allison Chains at a water park, all we're doing is goofing around, you know, and that was so, so great. And, and I liked the later shows because I think it was different, but when I watched the early stuff, it was like, oh my God. It was like, wow. I like, that way, by the way. <laughs> if I watched, if I was a kid watching me, I would write hate letters to myself. You didn't get hate letters, did you? Still do. Really? I still, oh my God, I get so much hate. So much hate. Oh, like, I mean, you're, you're talking about rock and roll. You're talking about artists what could people be mad at you about <laughs> because they don't agree with you with the songs that you choose yes, but because i have the greatest job in the world i mean i remember when i decided i wanted to start working in nascar people gave me such a hard time because i was a guy from hollywood but in rock and roll the thing about rock and roll is there's so many genres of rock and roll and while you might want skid row somebody else wants slayer and if you're playing skid row they're like well you suck because you're playing this band but there were so many different types of music you know, people were so mad that we had Nirvana. And the first, the biggest misunderstanding was that I had any say in videos right. in Headbangers Ball. I was on Headbangers Ball for five years. I picked one video that was played on my birthday, and that was a Motorhead video that they probably would have played anyway. So there was, there was no say in it. So, it, you know, with music, when you're a kid, music is very important, especially, I think, a couple decades ago. You know, music was when you were mad at your parents, you'd run in the room and you'd turn on the music and put your headphones on, and it was your escape. The posters on the wall, and that was rock and roll to you. And so people take it very personal. So if you're not representing their genre of rock and roll, they're mad at you. Whether The thing is, we had to appeal to everybody. There were people that wanted to hear, you know, the heaviest stuff and the not so heavy stuff. So they didn't know who to complain to, so they all thought it was me. All right, so correct me if I'm wrong here, but you grew up like a surfer kid, right? In, in California. Skateboarder. Skateboarder. Skateboard okay. punk rocker. That yes, was it. I do listen to the podcast. So when you were growing up before this, and I know you hate the hair metal terminology, right? Because it's yes. all metal. It's metal or it's rock and roll. But, rock before, and roll. but before we had the, the 80s rock, right? So what kind of rock and roll, what kind of music did you listen to? Young Ricky growing up on the skateboard parks. just doing Hard your rock. Hard rock. Punk rock. Punk rock. Still listen to it every day. Like the Ramones and like... Oh, there were a lot of LA bands that are a little uh -huh. bit more obscure, like TSOL Adolescence, Angelic Upstarts from, from the UK and stuff like that. But as a little, little kid, as a little kid, I loved Ted Nugent. And I remember, and I was a little kid then, I remember being so devastated when I found out that Ted Nugent wasn't the one singing the songs. <laughs> you know, that, that I thought he sang all the songs. And then when I started hearing him politically, and I saw him play live like not that long ago, like, oh, I don't know if I still like the Nuge anymore. But um, I, I liked, I mean, I liked everything as a kid, you know? I loved Thin Lizzy, but I, I still love ELO, you know? And I like a lot of stuff, but I think that growing up in LA, I listened to a lot of punk rock, and the Cat House, which was my club back then, we were kind of part of the LA rock scene and the punk scene, and, and it wasn't all, you know, Guns N' Roses and Faster Pussycat and L.A. Guns, we were kind of a guttural rock, punk rock, dirty gutter scene, you know, that just ended up becoming very hip and trendy, which was really weird. Okay, so what I love about the Cat House Hollywood podcast is, is obviously back in the, the 80s and the 90s, there were no social media, there was no Instagram, you know, no video phones, no, thank God. <laughs> thank oh, God. You uh, say that. I can really say right? that. Right? <laughs> thank goodness. Um, but you, in your Cat House Hollywood, Hollywood podcast, you dive into moments from the Cat House. You dive into moments that happened at your club that, that no one else, obviously I, was, I wasn't there, there were a lot of people that were not there, and, and you tell these stories, whether it be David Bowie or Axel or whomever it be, Motley Crue. I, what I miss out on is I want you to walk me through the Cat House. So I always try to envision like where things are happening in the Cat House like while you're telling these stories. So I do know that you talked about like the stairwell. So I'll have you start there, kind of the posters that you put up and the holes in the stairs and stuff like that so walk me walk me through if you were if i was oh, walking into the cat house you know one night on hollywood boulevard in back in the 80s and i'm walking and what does it look like well the first thing you're going to notice is is the we were in one location for a year and then moved to the very famous location but i'm going to take you to the very first location okay first of all this is in very swank uh right by the beverly center 
not too far from Beverly Hills, and we graffitied a Cat House logo on the wall of an old dilapidated disco. The first thing you're going to see is a line of Harley Davidsons. Because back then, I always said, hey, drive an American motorcycle, park it in front, we'll let you in free. Because I just was thinking of gimmicks, and I was a biker back then. So it was just lines of motorcycles. Then you walk through the door, and the stairway was literally dangerous. Because this was a rundown nightclub. And I came in there, and I would hammer posters on the wall. Like, I'd see, like, paint falling down. So rather than paint it, I would just hammer up a poster to cover up the holes. <laughs> and people would walk up the stairs. And literally, there was a danger of your foot falling through the stair. And there's a, there's a funny story that I think is one of the early podcasts. As, you know, me and my friend Keith trying to convince people, come on in, come on in. And these girls from Beverly Hills are like, oh, I don't know if they, we should come in. And they start to walk up, and they look, and slash is rolling down the stairs with a cat house security shirt on holding a big fake plant. And this is like the typical cat house. Then you walk up and there's this like bar. And if there's an old disco movie called Thank God It's Friday. And yeah, that was yeah. that disco was the club that the cat house was used. And there was an upstairs bar and you would just look out and there was a dance floor and it was just there was so just, VIP area, was there a VIP area? It was the whole air, it was the whole that, club VIP. That was the first club, the reason there wasn't really a VIP area, even though like Steven Tyler and David Lee Roth came to the club. The reason I opened the Cat House was I wanted a club for the people that didn't get into the Velvet Rope clubs. I wanted the club for the bad people, for the misfits, where if you sold 5 million records or you just sold a $50 toner for your copy machine, I don't care, <laughs> you know? But what happened was because we had this really decadent lifestyle and the women would dress very, very decadent at the time, it became almost a fashion thing where women's wear daily sports wear international were picking up on this like raunchy style of attire. And you, somebody that, that's not aware of it would think like, oh, it's sexist and they're all drunk, drink, dressing like bimbos. But the truth is there's school teachers, there's, you know, uh, business women that liked it as playtime, you know? That yeah. they figured, let's all have fun. And it was just decadent. There was music, always playing music. It was loud. People were drunk. People were doing all sorts of stupid stuff. When we moved to the second club, which was still similar, we'd have bands, but we try not to announce the bands. So you didn't know who was going to play. You didn't know if it was Guns N' Roses or Alice in Chains or Motor. I mean, we had Alice Cooper on Halloween. How cool is that? That's really, you know? yeah, that's really cool. It was just, and... It, it was the type of club that it was, you know, we, we didn't really have fights there. We didn't have egos. And I had this rule that at the time made sense that I wouldn't allow any cameras in the club, which was really great at the time. But what I didn't realize is, wow, I could have been capturing history. And what happened is I saw all these books and these reporters and podcasts talking about all these crazy rock and roll stories that started right next to me, like the Guns N' Roses Motley Crue feud. That yeah. started with something that happened right next to me. Yeah. And the David Bowie and Axel Rose thing, that happened in the DJ booth at the Cat House. I'm like, look, I haven't told these stories for 30 years. And everybody says, write a book. I'm just going to put them on a podcast. And so I put them out there. And then we had like, you know, the guys telling the stories themselves, the guys from the cult or, you know, I mean, sneaking John Five, who's the guitarist of Rob Zombie and a solo artist, sneaking him in when he was 14 years old. You know, it was just, it was such a great time. And, and, it, and I appreciate you telling everybody about the podcast I because I know that, that you've really supported it. And I remember walking to Holler and, and, uh, and Jamie McMurray, the NASCAR driver, also says like, dude, I, I run, I listen to your Cat House Hollywood podcast. I'm like, wow, that's, that's so, it's it just, you know, when I found out that you were listening to it, it was really flattering because, uh, you know, I've always watched what you've done. And it was just neat that people dig it because what I do is I try to paint a picture of what it was like in the 80s. And not just like, if you're not even into rock and roll, you're going to listen to it because I'm going to tell you about gas prices and what was happening in current events and just tell a story and didn't realize that I think I'm a pretty good storyteller and I really enjoy telling these stories. Yeah, I think, you know, when you, when you say you wish that you had cameras in there, when I try to explain to people what it was like before camera phones and before all of this stuff, I, I, I was thinking about it today because I knew I was going to talk to you. I, I feel like you felt safer 
you, you felt safe within the four walls that you could be yourself, that you could maybe act a little silly or do something a little silly and, and people wouldn't judge you or it wouldn't get out there. So that allowed people to really kind of just let loose and have fun. So I wonder if there had been phones or if you were sort of documenting anything, it, it might not have been as authentic Absolutely. as it was to be part of that. The first person who ever danced at the cat house, because I, the, the premise was a rock and roll dance club, not bands, the rock and roll dance club. That's what it was. And Axel used to go out on the dance floor and he would just take over the whole dance floor and start dancing by himself. And he said he would be doing his little thing, right? He'd be like That's working on how Axel always danced. Mm -hmm. And then girls would come to dance with him and he would just be in his own thing. <laughs> and it was like, if you were a guy, and now you think about it, if you were a guy and I want to go out there on the dance floor and dance on hard rock, it sounds weird, but because there were no cameras or no things allowed, nobody cared because, you know, anything that happens at the cat house, I hate to use that cliche, stays at the cat house, but anything that might have happened or didn't happen was just hearsay because there was no proof. Right. So it was just kind of this place where there was just a lot of, I mean, to say that it was raunch and roll and sleaze and debauchery sounds like just a cliche, but it really was that, that thing. I mean, what made the cat house truly famous? wasn't necessarily the bands that played there it was all the stuff that went on there and uh you know and i took it for granted because remember i'm just a kid that's opening up a club that really doesn't know what he's doing you know and the fact that it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and i was like wow and then they said okay we want the cat house guy to do mtv and i was like this is really great you know i didn't graduate and all of a sudden all these <laughs> things are happening and i just made up my own rules you know in no time, I've got an office on Hollywood Boulevard. I've got a merchandise company. And I didn't know what I'm doing. I'm just kind of, Shannon Hoon from Blind Melon was my receptionist, you know? That's so we were, that's cool. we that's were just We were just doing our own thing and hiring friends. And I was the guy of all my friends that didn't become a rock star, you know? So I'm like, well, I can't, I want to be in a band. So MTV came along and I go, well, this is kind of being in a band. You know? Absolutely. You got to be around those people. You know how, um, like, if you're in a room and someone walks in the room, like we did, you were at the uh, Panthers thing that I did um, a couple of Yeah, years. yeah. So Cam Newton walks in the room and, like, the energy in the room changes, right? Everyone knows that he's there. Who were the rock stars that when they walked into the cat house, the energy in the room just changed? Like, who were those people? I have to tell you one story about what you just mentioned, Okay. I have always been the biggest Cam Newton fan. <laughs> and I always said, that's the only person that I really want to meet. And when I sat down, he sat down right next to me. And Leah was saying, now's the time, go take a picture. And I was too scared. And I was too scared to go up and take, all I wanted was a picture with Cam Newton. And he was sitting right there. And the whole time, I was so starstruck. I ended up taking a picture with McCaffrey, who's such a nice guy, really such nice. a nice guy. And that was my moment that it was like, I was starstruck. But the truth is when Axel walked into the room, even though he was there every single week, there is something about him. And even though we had the biggest rock stars in the world, I mean, Robert Plant was at the bar and I didn't really notice it, but there was something about Axel. I mean, James Hetfield from Metallica sitting having drinks with Glenn Danzig, but there was something about Axel. I think about Axel. There was just something that, that he was, I mean, you know, so many years have passed and so many stories have been told, but that guy really had a persona, you know, to me, rock and roll is supposed to be dangerous. And if I see a band, I want to know that anything can happen. You know, that you don't know if this guy's going to play for three hours or if he's going to play three songs and walk off the stage. And I like that spontaneity being about rock and roll. And I would have to say it was him. I mean, you know, because I was, I grew up and was always around rock and roll, I can't say there was a rock star that I was really, really excited to meet. I mean, I never met David Bowie. He was at my club because I would hang out around the front. Mm -hmm. But I would say that, you know, it wasn't the guys in Metallica and Ozzy, eh, maybe, but it was, it was probably, I mean, Lemmy, when Lemmy was around, yeah. there was something about him because he was just, you know, he, that's my favorite band. You know, so that he actually became a friend, you know, because he was Motorhead before he was my friend. And to know that he became my friend was like, wow, I have a rock star friend. You know, the other guys were my friends before they were rock stars. So it was kind of weird. 
I saw Guns N' Roses for the first time when they were here in Charlotte recently. I'd never seen them before. And the when Slash was doing his solos, I mean, like there were times where, and I know this might sound dramatic, but I, I like, I felt like I was going to cry just because he's so buttoned up that 10,000 hour thing, like the whole band is right. But that 10,000 hour thing, and, and he's just so smooth and everything is so beautiful. And the way that he expresses himself, you know, through his, I mean, I, 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 I couldn't, like, it was amazing to listen to him. I could just sit there and listen to him for hours. It was really good. Plus really is it. I mean, of course they're a band and there's stuff like that, but he really is an incredible guitarist yeah. and you can tell his solos, but I know Guns N' Roses are great. I was really excited to see him in Charlotte and everything when they come back out here. But the truth is it's not like seeing Guns N' Roses in a front of Yeah, I, believe me. And you know, the thing is I say to my, I say to my husband when I go to these concerts is, you know, but even back in the day when like, I, you know, if I went to like a, a, I went to a Bush concert or I went to, um, you know, like Lollapalooza back in the day, like you were dancing, you were Limp Bizkit. I went to a Limp Bizkit concert. Like you were dancing. You weren't standing there with your cell phone, like taking a video of like you were, you were doing something. And, and that's what it is nowadays compared to like people were actively involved in the concert back in the day. And I feel like a lot of times, at least the concerts I go to, I'm sure that there are some out there still that are going on that are a lot more, um, you know, involved. Earlier this year, when was that? I don't even know. No, I guess it was last year. Who knows? I think it was in, it was in September. I went to France and I saw Alice Cooper play in France. They don't hold the phones up for the show. They don't. No. <laughs> um, when I like, is over, I'm going to go to France to see a, a concert because that would be amazing to see that. <laughs> and I feel like a hypocrite because I go to so many concerts and I like to go up and put some streaming live so everybody can see because wow. I'm at so many shows. But the truth is, it's like how often do you go back and look at those videos? And if you want to see a video of them, it's all over online. So I like to go there and really take in the show. And I get irritated that all I see is phones. And yeah. it's like, if you, if you would have known 20 years ago that would happen, you'd go, the future is not going to be like that. People go to concerts, but it's not. Everybody's just holding up their yeah. phone. And it's, it's kind of sad, you know? Yeah. Um, how many people have ever asked you to give you like a dream team, like rock band? So if you had to pick, you know, one singer, you know, one guitarist, uh, one bass, one drummer, who, have you ever had to put a dream team band together i would put slash as far as the guitarist okay. that's without a doubt mickey d from motorhead and now the scorpions is a drummer bass i don't know i can't think of it i don't know i, I mean i tend to just go towards the guns and roses guys but yeah i mean i don't know that's so hard. hard right it's like that question it's everybody's like if you're on an island with three albums what would you take and i'm like I don't, that's never gonna happen so i don't care i'm taking all of them first of all if i'm on an island they're not gonna have a record player so it doesn't matter like i hate those hypothetical rock questions because i honestly i listen to everything i know I love that's what i love about like the fact i mean so i listen to everything too right i mean i told you growing up that like i was like watching new kids on the block videos while you know, flipping back and forth between, you know, Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue with my girlfriends. Or, you know, I grew up in, in South Florida where you had bass, like heavy bass music. And, and, you know, then we had bassers or metalheads. That was the two things in, in Fort Lauderdale. And I fell somewhere in between with the, with the new kids on the block. But I listened- I to did not listen to them. You I will say I listened to everything. Have, did, you have, did you ever have any of like the pop Rocky people show up? I mean, there's a lot of stories is people don't realize it. Mark McGrath- New kids on the block hit people never showed up or or any of like the like the the I, I know I saw somewhere like Christina Applegate, but she was like she was part of, you know, Married with Children and had that like, you know, she was a little edgy. Uh Johnny Depp. Well uh, he was yeah, Johnny Brad Depp. Brad Pitt. There's a funny story about Brad Pitt calling my friend Jonathan No, Brad Pitt told oh, I wish I can remember who it was. <laughs> another famous actress to call my friend Josh to see, because Brad Pitt used to go to the cat house and always wait in line. I didn't know who Brad Pitt was. So that was kind of funny. But as far as pop stars, I'm sure there were, and I just don't remember. I mean, my club bordello, Cher, Michelle Pfeiffer went there. Um, a lot of people went there just because it was, it was just like, I want to go to a decadent rock club, you know? I don't remember which pop stars would have gone there. I'm sure there you know, were plenty. People want you to like reopen it. Like too bad you can't just do a night right? A night at the cat house and do it for like a, you know, charity or, but it wouldn't be the same. It still wouldn't be the same, you know, like ever. 
Well, I wanted to do a small tour that would be called The Night at the Cat House. Oh, that's it would cool. be only be in front of clubs that was like 500 seaters. And I wanted to take Faster Pussycat and LA Guns and then like an all-star jam band to start. And we would put videos all over the walls and make it this like decadent, like have like 60s videos of burlesque dancers and make this whole thing. But all the bands wanted so much money and I'm not going to charge 70 bucks to get in. So I said, okay, never mind. So I really wanted to do it. I wanted, but I wanted it to be experienced. Like I wanted people to show up and walk into their club and go like, wow. And everything looks different, you know? Like it'd almost be better as like a Vegas show, you know? With all these dancers and all this crazy there you stuff. Go. There you go. You could be doing that during this time, working on that, working on the, the, the cat, cat House Hollywood Vegas show. That's the first thing I need to get to right now. <laughs> Uh, before I let you go, uh, you know, we met in the NASCAR garage. I don't, I think maybe it was Atlanta or something. Gosh, it must've been back in 07 or 08. It was a long time ago. And I just, um, I remember walking up and introducing myself to you and uh, I was pretty new in NASCAR, but how did you get in it? Cause you know, I see you and I see Leah and, and you two are really the last people that I would think would live in Charlotte, North Carolina. You know I mean? Just, I mean, Leah is, I mean, she's as unique of a human being as I've ever seen in my entire life. I can't wait to have her do my tattoo, by the way. So yeah, she's I'm great. Her. Yeah. She's done, she did Ryan Blaney. She did yeah. Paul Menard. Yeah. Um, she's been doing some. But the thing is, is don't ask me why. I have always just loved NASCAR. I love it. I didn't like any other sport. I like talking, but I love NASCAR. And even there's episodes of Headbangers Ball with me wearing Dale Earnhardt shirts. I mean, I love NASCAR. And so I'd always heard about Charlotte as like the Mecca. Like people heard of Hollywood as being rock and roll Mecca. Charlotte was the NASCAR Mecca. And then I remember going to my first race in 1994, the Daytona 500. And I remember uh, I got to go in the pits and, and got to meet drivers. And I was just starstruck. And then when Dale Earnhardt won the Daytona 500, they caught, and he came, he came to the Planet Hollywood in Beverly Hills. And, and they called me up. They said, hey, Dale Earnhardt's going to give um, his uniform to the Planet Hollywood. We don't know who could interview him. Would you come and interview Dale Earnhardt? I'm like, oh, my God. Oh my God. That, was like, that was like crazy. So That's I showed cool. up to interview Dale Earnhardt at the Planet Hollywood. I had Dale Earnhardt personalized checks. I brought in a Dale Earnhardt cereal box. He didn't believe that I had the checks. I showed him. He signed him. I have it framed. It's like Ricky to Ricky Cash, Dale Earnhardt. So then as I kept on saying, you know what? I'm a rock and roll guy from Hollywood. I think I can help people get into NASCAR and show them that it's not just country Southern people. And I tried to pitch a show forever and nobody was interested in hiring me. Nobody was interested in hiring me. So I said, okay, I'm going to start a radio show. And I tried to do this radio show that would play rock and roll and talk about NASCAR. And then I pitched it to this lady. Three months later, somebody calls me and says, Hey Ricky, would you be interested in hosting a show that talks about NASCAR and plays rock and roll? I was like, yeah, that was You're a like, strike. Yeah, up maybe. <laughs> but I didn't care. I just took the job. It's Racing Rocks. I've been doing that show for 17 years now on radio stations all over America. But really quickly, I'll tell the story because this was funny. So I came up with this idea. I was a huge Jeff Burton fan. And I said, and I told uh, Kenny Wallace, who was on speed on race day, I said, hey, when Jeff Burton wins a race, I'll shave my head bald. So they called me on TV, and that was the first time I was on Speed Channel. And Jeff Burton ended up winning at Dover. So I was on Speed TV, and they shaved my head bald, which my only intention was just to get on Speed TV. So then I kept on weaseling my way, because all, all I wanted to do was work in NASCAR. That's all I wanted to do. And, you know, I, I was on NASCAR.com for a while, and um, that stuff ended, and I was bummed out. But, you know, I did some stuff with Fox Sports with Dale Jr. just as he was getting into the sport that was really fun. And uh, I never really got to do a lot of NASCAR TV, but I worked for a couple racetracks. So I just figured I was going to move to Mooresville, where everybody is, and I was going to do even more NASCAR work. And the truth is, it didn't happen. It didn't happen at all. So I started doing podcasts. And then, you know, I, I, I met Leah Vendetta, who's a famous tattoo artist. She was on the show Ink Masters. And we fell in love and I tried to convince her to come move with me to North Carolina. She knew nothing about North Carolina. And the truth is, even though I'm not doing NASCAR stuff out here, except for my radio show, I worked for a couple tracks. I worked for Dover and hopefully next year I'll be working in Nashville. 
Yes. And um, yeah, because that's owned, that's owned by the people from Dover. That'd be awesome. And the picture behind you is actually what your hair looked like last time I saw you. The one behind you. Oh, yes. You. Yes. That's, that's, that's what and I'll, like. I'll tell you the truth. Um, ta- when I was tattooed and I was walking around NASCAR tracks fully tattooed, I was like that weird guy with tattoos at the track. And that tattoos are so acceptable. Yeah. And I was like, well, not everybody has long hair anymore. So I'll just grow my hair out. And now that's even like, I'll be honest with you. I hate long hair. I hate it drives me up the wall. It's always in my face. It's hot now in North Carolina. It's hot and humid. It is. So I don't know how long I'm going to keep it long. But all the people that are my age are like, Ricky, you can grow your hair. We're all bald. It's yeah. like, be lucky. I'm like, okay, so let's keep it growing. So yeah, my hair grows so fast. But well, it'll be funny when I finally get back to the track. I think it was, who was it? Is it William Byron? It was Noah Gragson, of course, it would be him. It's like, dude, are you wearing a wig? And I'm like, <laughs> I kind of thought that for a quick second when we got on this podcast today. <laughs> none of these these NASCAR kids like have any idea what I used to do. Like I remember Brad Keselowski saying to me, he's like, dude, I just saw you interview a video of you interviewing their bodies. Like, what did you used to do? And I just took for granted that everybody knew, but you got to understand most of these drivers were born right. 10 years after Headbangers Ball, right. you know? How can I talk to a Harrison Burton or Noah Gregson or any of these kids and, or, you know, Todd Gillen and them have any idea? I'm just that weird old guy with tattoos that loves NASCAR. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky that I've got a really great relationship with William Byron that I interview him all the time. He just thinks that we do funny interviews. He has no idea what I was into. I mean, but, but, but I love those kids. I mean, I think that the sport right now has a bunch of really great kids coming into it, you know? And I'm really excited about the future. People don't know, Tyler Reddick is a hardcore metalhead, you know? I did not know that. Oh, yeah. He, and he knows his metal, too. Tyler Ankrum in the truck series, he's 18 years old, loves L.A. Guns. I did not know that. Now I have something that I could talk to. Isn't that crazy to think about like the the 20-year-olds that you're hanging out with now compared to the 20-year-olds that you hung out with back in the 80s? A little different. It's really weird to talk (laughs) to drivers that, you know, like, I I think Ryan Blaney would be a friend of mine. I look at Ryan Blaney as a friend, not realizing that I'm the same age as his dad, (laughs) you know? Oh, yeah. Yes, I, I, yeah. I know his dad pretty well too, just from, you know, back in the day when he was driving that when I first started in the sport, that's who I would interview all the time. It wasn't Ryan. I mean, he was a young boy, you know, you'd see him at the racetrack and, and he was now he's doing what he's doing. So. And isn't it funny that when he came into the sport, he was Dave Blaney's kid. Oh, and now Dave is Ryan's dad. Ryan's yeah. You know? Well, listen, Ricky, I appreciate your time. I'm going to, um, so I have a little camera right here. And what you can't see is that I actually have the Cat House Hollywood sticker on the back side of my computer. So I've right noticed here, that before. People have sent me pictures of it. Yeah, and I, I thought that was so, like when you do that, I, I really appreciate all the support. And it's, it's fun when I saw that and people are like, dude, you see the pictures of Shannon with the shirt? And, and I follow you just because like, of all the like Ironman and triathlons you do, I'm like, so envious of that, you know? Oh. Well, we'll get you. I know you mentioned getting on a bike, so we'll have to do that. We'll have to get you on a bike. Yeah, I did get a bike. The problem is, is now that I have the bike, is actually going out and riding the bike. Uh, it's hard. Like you can it's buy hard. really good running shoes. You can buy really good running shoes on a bicycle, <laughs> but if you don't use them, it really doesn't matter. But it, it does give you a little extra motivation. I always say. A little. Right? A little. <laughs> Ricky, you're so awesome. Thank you so much for taking a few minutes to chat with us. I had I so really much fun. Thank you. It. And look forward to seeing you at a track again eventually. Eventually. And and I look forward to hearing the latest edition of Cat House Hollywood podcast and rocking my uh, my new swag that I just ordered. So I just ordered some new swag. So oh, thank you. Yeah, oh. we sold out, so it takes a while. But oh, also, can I plug one more thing? Absolutely. I now work with American Flat Track. Oh, well, what are you doing with them? Um don't know because we went to the first race and it got canceled but um i'm kind of like the hype man like i have fun and i talk to the fans which of course <laughs> who knows now but i i have fun and i kind of do what i did with nascar is kind of bring out the personality of the riders but you know i'm even though i used to go to flat track races as a kid in pomona i'm still very new to that sport so i'm, I'm i also look at everything as a fan's perspective and i think that that's a sport that rock fans will get into because I think it's a, it's the first extreme sport. 
And I look at that sport the same way I looked as NASCARs, trying to bring all my friends into NASCARs. Hopefully I can bring my friends into American flat track as well. So I hope to be at all those and I'm going to try to ride my motorcycle to all the races because I'm going to try to ride all over America, of course, this summer. I, I do that every year. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm planning on riding to St. Paul and because I love that city. But, and people don't know, you know, all the all the, the protests and riots that happened. Is it such a great area? And I want to go back to that area. And I'll probably ride coast to coast this year. Who knows what I'll do on a motorcycle? While well, you're uh, planning the Cat House Hollywood Vegas show. Don't forget that. That'd be so much fun. So <laughs> much fun. Ricky, thanks so much for your time. I really Thank you. It. I had a blast. Okay. okay, be safe. For the best access, perspective, and personalities in all of sports, follow us at Fox Sports on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube.